Okay, today's little workout session is called hips and hammies, and it's for those runners out there who are struggling with strength in their hip flexors, the front of the hip, and their hamstrings, and a little bit of their glutes. So hips and hammies. Now, of common areas for runners to be weak in, and it can lead to either lack of performance or injuries down the track. So we're after the injury prevention part. The good thing about these exercises is they help improve the performance because you strengthen up the areas you're weak in, may even make you a little bit faster run or a little bit more stable, which is the idea we're behind today's session. The more stable you are, the more power output you're gonna put through when you're running. So, first thing we're gonna work on is the sort of the hamstring glute part. We're gonna work on posterior chain first, then we move to anterior chain. I like doing the posterior chain. If you're gonna do a workout, do the posterior chain first, then work on the front. So, for posterior stuff, we're gonna work on the hamstring. Now, you could do deadlifts, hamstring curls, all sorts of stuff. What I like doing is a single leg deadlift, but we're gonna do a little bit of bias to help you runners out there, because part of this stuff is about neuroprogramming just as much as strengthening. Runners need, especially sprinters, need a lot of neuroprograms to repeat business, so when they are running as fast as they can, it's automatic through your head. So if you can devise your training regimes, especially for kids, if you can make it, more like they are running and less sort of more like a gym workout, you'll probably find it helps them improve the neuro part of it, which improves the whole thing. The weight is going forward instead of straight down like using a kettlebell. Now, I'm using a power band, it's a light power band, it's because I'm an adult. If you're training a child or maybe a very sort of uh, a youth or even an adult that's quite weak, you might want to dial it back to a TheraBand, something that's a little bit easier. Regardless, it needs to be anchored down low and it needs to be, the trick is, opposite hand, opposite leg. So if I'm training my right leg, my right hamstring, I'm going to be standing on that leg. We're going to remember single leg loading for these exercises for runners, not double leg, single leg. This needs to be my left hand. The reason for that is when I come up and my left leg comes up, I want my right hand up, okay? So when I'm going down, my left, leg, left hand's forward. When I come up, my right hand's forward, which sort of mimics the running style. Remember, we're gonna try and make these interesting, like running, so they get that programming, their training, their exercising the muscle in the way they wanna use it. That's important. No point just doing hamstring curls, then trying to run. So, for this one, make sure you got the tension right that when you are down it's not all loosey goose okay so you might want to sort of go or well, how far down am i going and then step back a bit to make sure there's some tension on there but it can't be too much so when you come up you can't do anything with it all right so get that position right it might take you a bit of practice to get that right always have a bend in your knee all right so you're going to start upright with your knee up and your opposite hand up when you go down they go down leg goes back reach right out get the stretch on the hamstring and then come up to that position there the good thing about this is if you notice i'm a little bit wobbly you'll find when you start off you start off a bit wobbly as you get to learn to balance you get better and better and better less and less wobbly you don't have to worry about pulling this all the way in all right start off with this just going you're doing like a deadlift okay up and down so you don't have to bend your arm. There's enough tension on there for my glute and my hamstring. Now, I call this hips and hammies because not only are you doing hamstring training, you're posture training that drive into that hip extension, which is what you need, but you're balancing on one leg. There's a lot of glute work going on, a lot of hip work going on when you are standing on one leg. So you're getting the double whammy of glute work, stability-wise, the glute med, all that, with glute max, because it's helping out hip extension when you're doing hamstring work. So beautiful exercise for runners, especially those ones that have a little bit of balance control issues. So if they, if they are, if you do notice when they're running, maybe their knees roll in, maybe their heels going out, maybe their hips dropping in, maybe they're a little bit unstable. This is a good one because it teaches them a bit of balance when they do the hamstring work. So effectively, you're killing two birds with one stone. All right, so you're working on the balance, you're working on the strength, Okay, and those two things are going, are going to be really helpful. That's your first exercise. From that, work on hamstring curls on the ball. You need a bit of brute strength stuff. And to be honest, these things need to be done at home a lot of the time, especially if you're dealing with kids, or maybe you're doing them before a, a night before a session, that sort of thing, a running session. You're not always going to be able to get to the gym. Something like a Swiss ball is going to be great. You don't need machines with this. So this one, what I work on is trying to start off 
making sure that when you are up into this position, okay, your back is not arched, okay? Make sure your core is really on before you start pulling in. Now most kids, if you're talking about kids again, should be able to do this sort of work, okay? It's all relative to how strong they are. You shouldn't find this is too hard. I wouldn't necessarily get a kid doing single leg work until they're fully conditioned with this. So stick with two leg work. What it's gonna work on is a little bit of core work and back strength here while they're doing their hamstring curls. Because let's face it, you know, if you're doing a, dealing with a young child, they're not gonna be in the gym much, they're not gonna be doing hamstring curls per se and getting strong. This gives them just functional strength. We don't necessarily have those hamstrings super big. We just need them working and strong. It's a nice one to work on. So hamstring curls I throw in there um, straight after that single leg one. It's a really nice one to do. Then, the last one before you get to the front hip is a hip thrust, but what I suggest you do with your hip thrust, again, we're doing a bit of a running bias, is go back to a single leg. So instead of, you'll see this in the gym, instead of doing two-legged hip thrusts, okay, sometimes they have bands on here, we've done those before, some of them have bar on here for a bit of weight loading. That is great, but for runners, we want to sort of use our time in strengthening the hamstrings and the hips, so hamstrings and glute, with a bias of balance and single leg loading control. Because you may find you might be strong in this position, okay, but you're no good on one leg. So when you're running, you're on one leg. So you've got to train like you're going to perform. What I would do, usually you have your feet wide, okay, bring them in almost parallel, not quite, like you would when you're running, okay. They don't have to be dead like that, okay, certainly not straight in the middle, but pretty close, okay. And then what you can do is when you come up for the first one, remember shoulders on here, trying to get as much hip extension as you can and core on, then you raise one leg, and then you drop down, and then drive your heel through the floor, thrust upwards, and you're really going to feel that through the hamstring and the glute. Because you are now, not, not only are you doing hip extension, you are stabilizing on one leg, and the weight is more because it's only one leg. It's, think of like doing this with a bar load here, okay? There's quite a lot of difference when you go to one leg. So from here, and I do this, you'll find that, oh, I can feel that way more in my hamstring. This also allows you, like the first exercise, to work on one leg that is weaker than the other. Sometimes some people have a weaker leg, especially if someone is very dominant coordination-wise. So maybe say they're a right footer or they're a left footer and they play a lot of sport and you notice that they are running a little bit differently, maybe because they've got strength on one side more. And that might be neuroprogramming strength, you just have to sort of program that one out. But it allows you to do something that's a little bit different, single leg work, that's a little more focused on running rather than the double leg stuff. So don't get caught in the trap of just doing weighted hip thrusts, switch to the single leg, unweighted, and then see how you go. And remember, you're trying to go for programming, so you're better to up your rep range rather than upping the weights. So do more reps for the fatigue rather than the weights for the fatigue, okay? So once you've done those ones, you sort of covered your hamstrings, hip drive, hip extension, you've got a bit of glue in there, got a bit of balance in there, then you work on the front of the hip. Now, what I like starting off with especially for people who are a little bit weak, maybe if, even if you're recovering from a hip flexor injury, is to do something like a straight leg raise over something. So a standard straight leg raise is pretty simple stuff, being able to do that. But what I like doing is getting people warmed up is getting it over something. Now I've just got a kettlebell here. You could use anything. It doesn't have to be a kettlebell. It could be a, a shoe or anything. Just something that's high enough that they actually challenge them to get their leg up and over. So you might start with something low and then as they get better, they go higher and higher. Just make sure when you lift this, squeeze your quads, okay? So keep the quads on and then lift it up, tap it, and just keep tapping. And I would do around about 18 to 20 of these, nice and slow. Don't sort of do this sort of thing, there's no point doing that. Try and go slow and controlled. The time under tension is what's gonna get a little bit of the fatigue and more strengthening through the front of the hip, okay? And this is just gives them different angles to work on, all right? So you think of count them out, give them to count, how many times can you do it? Can you get to 20? That means 10 taps each side, not letting the heel drop down and rest, okay? So it's tap, there's no weight bearing through the heel, and they'll eventually get to the point where they feel that fatigue 
right in front of the hip, okay? And again, you can really test out if they've got a strength difference left and right, all right? So they do twin on that side. Is there a major difference? Do they need to work on one side more than the other? And again, you could actually use this exercise as a bit of a warm-up prior to a run as well to fire the hip flexor. Um, so don't be afraid to do that. This is a really nice one to work on. Pretty simple, pretty basic, but super effective for trying to train the hip flexor to lift a long lever load, which is what they do when they run. Then what you work on is a little bit more heavier strengthening. Again, like the first exercise we did, it's very much biased to runners, gets uh, the movement pattern a little bit better, and it helps with younger kids who uh, need some sort of activity activity-based exercise, rather than just doing strengthening, they want to do it like they are running, helps the neuroprogramming, makes it a little bit more interesting. What you work on, same band. So whatever band you had for the deadlift pull, you use for a hip drive. Now, I would go, I wrap it around the front like that, okay? Then it's gonna stay on. This one, you go forward to the point, again, there's gotta be some tension here. So when it's down, there's tension here. You don't want it loose down here and tight up here. It doesn't want to be loose down there. It needs to be tight. Not too tight that they can't even lift it. Now, I would stay even feet. Remember, with runners, they want to be sort of landing underneath their foot. So don't let it come back like that. You've got to train almost like an A step. So when they come up, their leg comes up to 90 degrees. When it comes down, it comes down to where the foot is, all right? Not back here. So if you find that when they come down, they're always, it's always putting them back, maybe you've got the tension too much, all right? So get that tension right. Help them by making sure when, say, my right leg comes up, my left arm comes up, which is like a running drive. Right leg up and down. Right leg up and down. And so they can practice their running style while they're working on strengthening the front of the hip. So that sprinting drive, the movement when you're jogging, knee up, down underneath your hip, okay? They're doing that, they're practicing that movement while they're strengthening. And again, how many reps? Well, go to fatigue almost with this, not massive fatigue, until they feel like they're really working. You may find a set of 10 is not enough. The band tension, you know, if it's too much, they might even get to a set of 10. So just try and get that rep range reasonably high. I probably wouldn't go more than 20, so maybe make it around about enough tension that they went below 20 they're feeling that fatigue through there and then by the time they get to the third set you know they're really working on there but not so much that it actually causes any problems so that's my five see how that goes for your runners see you next time